scriptures from Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. This is Paul. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear what we should do about some of our prayers that we were praying this morning. I was thinking the same thing. Finally, be strong in the Lord and be in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of the righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit of all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Here is the reading of Paul's holy word. So in our scripture for today, we find Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, and in this portion of the letter, he is extorting the ideas of putting on the armor of God. Now, when we hear this scripture, and when we read this scripture about putting on the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the protection for your feet of the gospel of peace, and taking up your shield of faith, your helmet of salvation, your sword of the Spirit. I don't know about you guys, but I almost get this mental picture of a medieval knight getting ready to do battle, all this armor that's been put upon them. Now, it makes sense that Paul chose this idea to describe the standpoint of armor, this idea of everything to be the armor of God. Because if you think about when Paul was writing, one of the major employers of people was the army. And it's also relatable that though not everyone may have served in the army at this time, they would have surely seen soldiers walking around adorned in their armor. So it's a great example of Paul trying to speak to the people in ways that they can understand. You know, just like Jesus used parables to speak to us so that we'd understand, Paul uses this picture of, an, of a soldier to help them understand as well. But let's look, dig a little bit deeper into what Paul expresses to us when he suggests we put on the armor of God. The first thing to note, I think, uh, that's interesting, is when Paul tells us to put on the armor of God, and this will probably sound a little bit nerdy, but I think it is important to think about. In the original Greek, the way that it translates is, we are to put the armor of God on, but then to never take it off. And it's an interesting idea. You think about a soldier when they get dressed in their armor, and then they go out on patrol or they go out to battle. But when that battle is over, that patrol is over, they come home and they take off their armor and they go about their business as usual. But Paul urges us to put our armor on and to keep it on. Now, when we think about the enemy that Paul describes for us, he's warning us against the devil and against evil itself. And when we think about Satan, we know 
that he is a relentless enemy. He's going to work to take advantage of any opening that we give him. So now we can understand why Paul tells us to put the armor of God on and then to never take it off so that we are ready at all times to defend and battle that enemy whenever he tries to get at us. Now, I know that sometimes when we talk about Satan and how he's trying to get at us through sin, you can find yourself becoming worried. You know, is there something out there lurking that's trying to get me? And we almost allow Satan to become this idea of the boogeyman to us, right? But there is absolutely no reason why we should feel that way. And here's the best news that I could ever tell you if you're concerned about that. And it's this. Jesus has already won the battle against Satan. That is done and over. Through his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus won that battle for us. But you see, that is why Satan tries to take advantage and make our lives miserable wherever he can. Because he knows he's already lost the big battle. But he wants to take as many people as he can with him on that losing side. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you've accepted him as your savior, the devil has no power over your life. Indeed, we're told we speak his name, Jesus' name, and evil cannot stand against it. So the area that I think we need to be most, most concerned about is making sure that we do not give the devil opportunities to get into our lives. Or perhaps think of it this way. Don't allow yourself to go down the wrong path. You see, when we allow for cracks to appear in our armor, when we are not focusing on the things that we should be, that is where we find ourselves vulnerable to making mistakes and giving opportunities to the enemy. Perhaps the greatest double-edged sword that we have in this world that we are given by God is free will. You see, when we exercise free will in making good choices and following the teachings of Jesus Christ, there is nothing that that sort of free will cannot cut through. There is no enemy that it cannot stop. But when we make bad choices, bad decisions with that sort of free will, it's pretty easy for us to cut ourselves or to put nicks into our own armor and allow opportunities for the enemy. When I was thinking about my thoughts of evil in this world and free will, I thought about someone that may have an addiction to drugs. Now I'm not gonna argue against the idea that there's a systematic problem in this country when it comes to drug use. And I'm not going to take the standpoint that someone who is addicted to drugs is an evil person because of their addiction. That is not something I will never advocate for. However, ultimately the decision for someone to use drugs is one that is made by that person. See, they have their own free will and they make that choice, at least the first time, to use those drugs. Now, in the case of many addicts, that ultimately leads to evil being done. <laughs> so let us consider someone who is an addict and then needs to rob or to lie or to cheat others in order to gain money to further that addiction. See, all those evil acts that come afterwards can be traced back to that initial choice to use the drugs. However, we need to think about this in the idea of corporate neglect as well. And what I mean by that is this. We as people choose to ignore the problems of drug addicts in our society. We choose to look past what may have pushed them in that direction. We choose to demonize them instead of offering them help. And as a result of our choices not to help, we find those situations become worse and those acts become more evil. And as such, a society that does not act in ways that help others perpetuates evil in this world. See, in my own life, I've seen how it has played out in the lives 
of so many people. I've seen how my own choices not to help have led me down paths where I was guilty of committing evil. And I've seen how evil was a result of personal choices that friends and family have made. See, one decision can lead you down a path that will ultimately breed evil into this world, while another decision will lead you down the path that can stop evil from entering into this world. We must consider the evil of apathy. After all, what good is putting on the armor of God if we're not going to use it? You see, inaction as our part as Christians can lead to giving the devil opportunities. In our scripture, Paul is imploring us to pray for him so that he may proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly. And as Christians, we are called to do the same, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly. You see, armor is not just for defense. Armor is also for offense. So we must be telling others about the love and grace that Jesus Christ has for them. We must be telling others the things that Jesus has taught us, speaking out against things like violence and hatred, just as Jesus himself once did. So how do we stop ourselves from making those wrong choices? Well, when I was younger, there were bracelets that everyone used to wear, and they said WWJD, right? And now you guys probably know that that stands for... What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Right. And I think we've kind of allowed ourselves to ignore that these days. But that is what we should be asking ourselves in every single situation that we find ourselves in. Whenever there is a difficult question for us, what would Jesus do? So, not only just asking ourselves that, but asking Jesus himself, praying to him, asking for his guidance. Lord, what should I do in this situation? What would you have of me in this situation? And then where else can we look? Well, we can find out what Jesus would have us do by careful study of his word. It is written to us and given to us so that we would know what Jesus would want us to do in those situations. And so if we really pause and consider what Jesus would want us to do in any situation, then we can help bolster that armor that God has given to us. And if we put on the armor of God, if we polish it with the word of God, and we boldly proclaim Jesus as our Savior, we can surely avoid making mistakes that allow the devil opportunities to cause us to sin. My challenges for you this week are these. Are you fully clothed in the armor of God? Is there an area that you need to look at and improve upon when it comes to making sure that you are following what Jesus would have you do?